Hello and welcome to the IMF Summer School course preview on public financial management or in short PFMX. The COVID-19 pandemic has tested government's ability to design and adopt timely and impactful policies to support both people and firms. In challenging times, it's more vital than ever to ensure that public resources are spent efficiently and on the right measures, and that governments are accountable for these decisions. This is what public financial management, or PFM, is all about. PFMX is a course from the IMF designed to teach you about public financial management and why it matters. In it, you will learn about why the budget is the government's main policy tool, how to manage resources and report transparently. Let's begin by taking a look at what you can expect to get out of PFMX. Starting with the testimony by Vivek Ram Kumar from the International Budget Partnership on the importance of PFM and budgets. Budgets are any government's most important economic policy instrument that affects the lives of all citizens, but especially poor citizens. There's a growing and emerging consensus, at least among experts, that the best way to manage public funds efficiently and equitably is through budget systems that are transparent, open to public engagement and scrutiny, and that have robust oversight institutions and mechanisms. And this expert view is also shared by citizens. And let me give you an example to illustrate why citizens would consider information from governments to be important. Several years ago, uh, a former colleague of mine, Sushila, who's a mother of three and has received very little formal education, was attending a public meeting in which there was a discussion about India's right to information law. A journalist at that meeting asked Sushila why she felt that the information law was important. She replied that when I send my son to the market with 10 rupees to buy something, when he comes home, I ask him to tell me how he spent that money. Similarly, when the government spends my money, I have a right to know how the government has spent my money. Every year, governments are collecting and spending billions of dollars of taxpayer funds, and citizens just have a right to know how governments are spending their money, and they need this information to be given to them in a timely manner, comprehensive manner, reliable, accurate, and accessible formats. I find that Vivek summarizes really well what PFM is about and how we covered it in this course. Remember what he just said about his friend Sushila. Well, good PFM can assure Sushila that the government has the tools to understand why it spends money in a certain way, decide what it plans to spend in a year or more, manage its cash in the best way possible to meet spending deadlines, explain and report how money was actually spent, and it can reassure her that there are independent institutions that can scrutinize and certify that the spending was done according to the rules and plans. Now, to understand what PFM is and why it matters. Here are a few excerpts from the first few modules of the course. So what is public financial management or PFM? And why does it matter? Simply put, public financial management or PFM is how governments manage their resources, public finances. It refers to laws, organizations, systems, and procedures that are required for a government to implement fiscal policy well. In other words, PFM is about the institutions that make fiscal policy work. We refer to PFM institutions as tangible, concrete budget institutions. For example, the organization and operations of the Ministry of Finance or line ministries, a supreme order institution, 
but we also refer to institutions as a set of laws, procedures and frameworks. These exist to ensure that the government manages their finances well. This could be a law or regulation and sometimes even the constitution. In this course, this is an important concept that you should keep in mind. When we talk about institutions, not only do we refer to public entities and organizations, but also to a full set of laws, systems, and procedures in place to ensure good implementation of fiscal policy. As a result, PFM is the intersection of economic policies and decisions, their implementation, and political factors. These are all underpinned by laws and regulations. Now that you know what PFM is, you may wonder why it actually matters. In this module, we will look at the relationship between public financial management and fiscal policy. In fact, PFM and fiscal policy are two sides of the same coin. What does it mean? Well, let us choose a simple example. Like households and companies, most countries in the world need to ensure there are enough resources to cover spending in any given year. So how do fiscal policy and PFM cater to this objective? Fiscal policy, on the one hand, looks at what to do. It proposes spending cuts or tax increases to make ends meet. It chooses which tax or which spending item should be targeted so that the measures are beneficial to the economy. PFM, public financial management, on the other hand, looks for information, processes, and rules that support fiscal policy choices. For example, it considers how spending should be reviewed or assessed to know what to cut. It asks how revenue collection should be organized to guarantee that resources actually come in. PFM is what makes fiscal policy work. Fiscal policy outlines what to do. It asks what fiscal measures to take to reach an objective. PFM deals with how to do. It asks how to implement fiscal measures so that they are successful. Without strong public financial management, fiscal policy will never succeed. As discussed, this course is structured around the budget cycle. But what is the budget cycle? Let's look at each stage of the cycle in more detail. The budget cycle starts with the fiscal framework. This is when fiscal policy is determined. The fiscal framework is a two-way process. First, fiscal policy is constrained by what PFM dictates regarding fiscal responsibility. And second, PFM instruments translate fiscal policy objectives into budget aggregates and fiscal targets for borrowing, often adopted as the budget law. The second phase of the cycle is budget preparation. During this stage, the composition of spending is planned by the executive branch of government. And this happens before the budget year starts. The budget is also approved by the legislature or parliament. The third phase concerns budget execution. This is when the government implements the policies of the budget. The government will authorize spending during this phase and also the government needs to manage its cash to minimize borrowing. We're now halfway through the cycle, and as we turn the corner, we'll reach the fourth phase, accounting and reporting. During accounting and reporting, data on planned and past spending is prepared in a consolidated format. This is sometimes completed by the government, and sometimes by independent external agencies. And to the fifth phase. The fifth phase relates to control and audit. 
Control and audit is when actual expenditure of the budget is audited and assessed for that all-important accountability. The final accounts are the basis used to prepare the new budget cycle. And now we're at the fiscal framework once more. As we moved around the cycle, there at the center and the heart is the legal framework. The legal framework underpins many of the institutions, the processes and the rules that guide PFM. The budget cycle is core to how the IMF thinks about public finance. Let's dig a bit further into the later modules of the course and look at two important questions. Firstly, what is the timeline for budget preparation and adoption? Secondly, where does fiscal reporting fit in the budget cycle? In this video, we'll discuss the budget calendar and we'll present a sample budget calendar incorporating the reforms we discussed in the previous video. In budget preparation, it's important that there is a formal budget calendar, that is stable from year to year, and that it sets out when key documents were provided, especially to the legislature. It's also important that it allows sufficient time for the involvement of all the relevant participants. International guidelines recommend allowing the legislature one month to review the fiscal strategy statement, and ideally three months to review the budget. This slide sets out a sample modern budget calendar with the different stages of the budget process. Budget preparation typically starts nine to 12 months ahead of budget implementation. For this example, we use the fiscal year which corresponds to the calendar year. We have divided this calendar into the four stages of budget preparation and approval, which we discussed in the first video of this module. The first stage is a strategy setting stage, and that is from January to April. In this stage, the strategic priorities are set and the limits on expenditure are established. The second stage is guidelines and submissions, and that is from May to June. In this stage, the Ministry of Finance establishes budget guidelines, or the budget circular, and ministries submit their budgets to the Ministry of Finance in accordance with these guidelines. The third stage is the review, negotiation and reconciliation stage, and this takes place in July and August. In this stage, the Ministry of Finance reviews budget submissions, negotiates with ministries and finalises the budget. This budget is then sent to Parliament and the Parliament approves and authorises the budget between September and December. Individual countries' budget calendar will vary extensively. Some will be shorter, others will be longer. Also, the sequencing of different stages can depend on tradition, but also if a country has implemented reforms. An example of reform is a medium-term budget framework. In countries with a medium-term budget framework, this framework should guide the budget process. The first stage in the process would include rolling over and updating revenue and expenditure forecast included in the medium term budget framework for the upcoming budget. In this section, we will present the role of fiscal reporting in the budget cycle. You might be asking why fiscal reporting is so important and why it is illustrated as a separate stage in the budget cycle. Well, in a world where the complexity of government's operation is ever increasing, reliable fiscal data are essential for governments to formulate and evaluate their fiscal policies. Without good and reliable information, governments cannot make sound decisions about public finances nor can they monitor the implementation of fiscal policy measures. Moreover, unless information is published, governments are unlikely to be held accountable 
for those decisions. By accountability, we refer to government's reporting to the citizens who elected them and the obligation to report to legislature. Existing data of government can be organized in different ways. It can produce different types of reports for various purposes. You might be familiar with terms such as budget execution reports, income statements, or balance sheet, among others. You might be asking what kind of reports can be relevant for fiscal analysis. Well, it depends on the purpose of the reports. In general, we identify three types. First, we have the reports of the budget execution. They are fundamental feature for a sound budget management system. It provides a framework for both policy decision making and ensuring parliamentary and financial accountability. Secondly, we have financial reporting, which aims at helping decision making and enforcing accountability. It would provide the primary source of information needed to assess the government's ability to fulfill its obligations. Finally, we have statistical reporting, where the data produced is used for analysis and assessment of macrofiscal policies and international comparability. These data are used to analyze the size of government and its contribution to aggregate demand, investment, and saving. It also measures the impact of fiscal policy on the economy, such as through policies related to taxation and spending or borrowing and investment. These types of reporting can be produced within the year or at the end of the year. Any reports should be frequent and regular. Their purpose is to increase timeliness and ensure availability of data during the period to facilitate fiscal analysis. The monthly budget execution report is an example of in-year report. End-of-year reports aim at producing reliable and high-quality data facilitating accountability. Financial statements are an example of end-of-year report. Usually, they are subject to external scrutiny through a supreme audit institution. How do we ensure that a country, even one with low capacity, is able to adopt and implement sound PFM practices? We learn about the specificities of PFM reforms in fragile states and hear from the former Minister of Finance of Guinea talks about her experience of PFM challenges in her country. Let's now talk about designing PFM reforms in fragile states. I will spend some time explaining the diagram on this slide because it highlights some of the main characteristics to designing fiscal strategies depending on the country's degree of fragility. The way to read this picture is to move from the lower left corner and upwards to the right. The red square represent the stage of the highest fragility, that is countries in the midst of conflict or natural disaster. The dark yellow square is where countries are immediately post-conflict. The light yellow is where countries are relatively more stable but still vulnerable. The progression from one stage to another is often not linear. Countries may start from zero, move to the next category of immediately post-conflict and then fall back into conflict. And we can talk about South Sudan, for example. Technical assistance from donors may go back and forth, helping to build fiscal institution at a very basic level, making some progress and then having to return to the starting point once again. So let's explain this figure. For countries that are experiencing major insecurity 
or political instability. They are in conflict and they are the most vulnerable and for which technical assistance provision is not possible. The approach is to wait. This is the red quadrant here. When security conditions improve, immediately post-conflict countries, for example, it is important to focus on establishing basic PFM systems. At this stage of fragility, experience shows that focusing on budget formulation, budget execution and cash management have significant leverage on PFM institutions. For countries that have moved out of the immediate post-conflict period, technical assistance should be designed to modernize fiscal institutions incrementally through medium-term strategies. The focus will naturally move to medium-term budgeting, IT systems, internal control, accounting standards, and annual financial statements, and cash and debt management. Of course, these approaches are not one size fits all and are very much influenced by the starting conditions in each country. And as mentioned earlier, a strong coordination with donors should be enforced at each stage to avoid overlap and ensure consistency in the reforms. To summarize, Fragile states, even if they are very different by nature, have common characteristics and challenges that need to be taken into account when designing their PFM reforms. The level of fragility needs to be understood and implementation of reforms need to be tailored to this level of fragility, which often determines the capacity levels. In fragile states, coordination of donors is absolutely critical to avoid overlap and ensure smooth implementation of reforms. Aid coordination is also necessary for aid effectiveness. Donc, je suis au ministère des Finances et de l'Économie depuis le mois de janvier 2016, et je dirais que dans l'architecture institutionnelle actuelle, donc la Direction nationale du Trésor euh, dépend de mon, de mon département. Euh, en ce qui concerne, je dirais, les, les défis euh, posés par la gestion de la trésorerie, euh, ils sont importants. Euh, il s'agit pour nous, je dirais, de vraiment pouvoir euh, être sûr euh, qu'au moment où, euh, je dirais, la chaîne des dépenses est euh, complète et au moment où nous recevons les, les demandes de paiement, nous soyons sûrs que les ressources sont disponibles pour effectuer ces, dé ces, ces dépenses. Euh, nous avons mis en place euh, des outils. Euh, nous avons un comité de trésorerie qui se réunit mensuellement euh, sous l'égide euh, du Premier ministre, euh, ainsi que du ministère du Budget, de la Banque centrale. Euh, et ce comité en fait, nous permet, euh, je dirais, sur la base d'une estimation mensuelle des recettes, euh, de faire euh, une, une liste des dépenses euh, à effectuer euh, pour le mois. Euh, alors, euh, s'il s'agit d'une programmation, bien évidemment, euh, qui euh, parfois, malheureusement, peut être perturbée, euh, je dirais, par des urgences, euh, par euh, des imprévus, euh, comme par exemple euh, un pont qui s'écroule euh, dans une région donnée, euh, ou d'autres, je dirais, d'autres événements euh, non prévus. Et là, je dirais que toute la difficulté pour nous euh, est euh, de pouvoir faire des arbitrages nécessaires euh, pour pouvoir euh, euh, mettre à disposition euh, des secteurs qui rencontrent ces urgences euh, les ressources nécessaires. Euh, donc pour nous, il s'agit vraiment aussi de pouvoir s'assurer que les ressources euh, qui sont estimées dans le cadre de ce plan de trésorerie mensuel euh, soit bien là euh, en, temps, en temps opportun. Euh, il peut s'agir de donc il s'agit évidemment des ressources euh, domestiques, euh, les recettes fiscales, mais nous attendons aussi parfois des concours euh, de la part de partenaires euh, sous forme d'appui budgétaire. Euh, et là aussi, parfois nous rencontrons quelques difficultés puisque ces appuis euh, ne sont pas toujours, je dirais, décaissés en temps utile. Leur prévisibilité euh, 
nous avons moins de contrôle dessus et c'est pour ça que ça fait, ce sont des questions d'ailleurs qui, qui sont des questions récurrentes que nous discutons euh, avec nos partenaires. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, la, euh, la comptabilité euh, publique, hein, euh, sur ce plan-là, je dirais que les, donc il s'agit notamment de l'élaboration de lois de règlement euh, et euh, les, des comptes de gestion. Euh, ce sont donc euh, là aussi des documents importants que nous devons euh, concevoir euh, et qui permettent en fait euh, au gouvernement euh, d'assurer la redevabilité sur les gestions passées. Et je dirais qu'ici, les défis auxquels nous sommes confrontés particulièrement actuellement en Guinée, euh, c'est que, euh, comme euh, vous le savez peut-être, nous avons eu, je dirais, des, des troubles politiques hein, avant, je dirais, la... Euh, le rétablissement d'élections de, de, démocratiques. Et euh, nous n'avons pas, par exemple, pu, pour les comptes de 2000, euh, 2008 à 2000, 2000, 2010, nous ne sommes pas en mesure de pouvoir produire euh, une comptabilité sur pièces, puisque ces pièces ont été détruites ou euh, n'existent tout simplement pas. Et donc là, il y a, nous avons eu à effectuer, en fait, nous avons reçu l'appui, entre autres, du Mali et aussi de la Cour des comptes du Sénégal, parce que le Mali, en fait, a traversé une, une situation similaire. Et donc, ces échanges avec les pays, je dirais, des pays, d'autres pays de la sous-région, échanges d'expérience, nous permettent aujourd'hui de trouver, de trouver une, une solution. Euh, qui serait euh, principalement d'établir une comptabilité euh, uniquement sur chiffres, en fait. Let's conclude with a few words from the Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department of the IMF, Wito Gasper, explaining why PFM is a critical area for both the IMF and governments. Vito, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Manal. Let me ask with a very basic but important question. Why is public financial management such an important topic for the IMF? There are many ways to answer that question. The version that I prefer at this point in time comes from uh, uh, last year's Richard Good lecture that was delivered from Esther Duflo uh, from uh, MIT. She was saying that uh, economists should be also very much like uh, plumbers. They should be able uh, to lay down the pipes and fixing the leaks. To a very large extent, public financial management is exactly about that. You have a very general concept about fiscal policy. You have a number of principles that guide fiscal policy, but policymakers have to trust that what they want to see done will actually be delivered. And PFM ensures that that will be the case. And I'm sure uh, this will resonate with a lot of the senior policymakers that are watching us. And what is FED's role in supporting the PFM agenda? Our main customer is the membership of the IMF, that is, our main customer will be a country. And for countries, we do a number of things. First and foremost, if a country engages with us, we have a number of diagnostic tools that we can deploy to help countries find out where they should act. We have uh, fiscal transparency uh, evaluations. We have uh, PMAS that allow countries to look at their public uh, investment processes and procedures. Uh, we have uh, PIFAs where we engage with other organizations to look at public expenditures and uh, financial accountability. But then we have very good experts both at headquarters and in the field that can go on and deliver very specific granular advice about how to do it. And that's our strength uh, in FAD. That's the value of PFM. But quite apart from that, we also engage in conceptual work, analytical work, policy work, which is complementary to the detailed work that we do uh, in the PFM field. 
And why is this online course important for FAD? As we've covered in earlier uh, uh, questions, our engagement with countries is uh, very uh, important and the link of fiscal policy with inclusive growth, uh, the sustainable development goals, the, uh, uh, the contribution that we can make uh, for inclusive growth, make sure that there is a tremendous amount of demand for uh, technical engagement in these very important topics. But leveraging new technologies uh, allows us to reach out to a broad audience of people. People who work in the national administrations, people who work in development agencies or international organizations, and of course also the public at large. Fiscal transparency and accountability are very important topics for the public at large. Thank you very much, Vitor, for joining us. Thank you, Manal.